Okay, welcome to episode number four of the APS Stamp Chat series. Thank you for joining us. I am Eric Spielvogel, Director of Education here at the American Philatelic Service. Tonight, we have the privilege of having with us Dr. Jean Wang, her presentation titled Topical and Thematic Collecting and Exhibiting. Dr. Jean Wang is a hematologist and leukemia researcher at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center in Toronto with an interest in medical philately. She's an active thematic collector and an exhibitor with a five-frame grand award-winning exhibit that explores the science and societal impact of blood donation and transfusion. Jean has given numerous presentations on medical, philately, and thematic collecting and exhibiting, and has written articles for various philatelic journals, including the Canadian, Canadian Philatelist, sorry, Topical Time, and the Philatelic Exhibitor. I'm sure that doesn't even cover the range of publications. Jean is a member Ship Director of the Philatelic Specialist Society of Canada and the editor of the annual PSSC Journal and the North Toronto Stamp Club Newsletter. She is the RPSC Delegate to the Federation Internationale de Philately Thematic Commission. Sorry for you French speakers, I totally hacked that up. A member of the Board of Directors of the Vincent Graves Green Philatelic Research Foundation and since 2018 has been a member of Canada's uh, Canada Post Stamp Advisory Committee. In April, Jean was the first Canadian to be appointed to the Board of Trustees of the American Philatelic Research Library. For those watching the presentation live, your microphone and camera are disabled during the presentation. To engage fellow attendees, please use uh, the comments, uh, the question in the chat section. And if you have a question, please use the question box and we'll get to those questions at the end of the presentation. If you're watching this as a recording later, please feel free to ask questions in the comments section. We'll get to those. Any questions that we don't cover live, we only have 60 minutes, we will uh, cover later and Gene can get back to you directly with those. This program is provided thanks to generous support of APS members. If you're not already a member of the APS or would like more information about our services, please visit our website at stamps.org. Gene, welcome to Stamp Chat. Thanks so much for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, tonight I'm going to talk about topical and thematic collecting and a little bit about exhibiting. So I'm going to keep this fairly broad, uh, aimed to sort of give you a high level overview of the area and um, some uh, hints uh, about how you might go about starting a topical or thematic collection, or if you've already got one, maybe how to expand it um, and uh, branch out a little bit. So what I'm going to cover tonight is, first of all, what is topical or thematic collecting in contrast to other types of uh, stamp collecting. I'm going to give you some tips about uh, different aspects of topical collecting, things to consider when you're building your collection. Uh, how to expand a topical collection beyond stamps. So stamps, of course, is how we all enter the hobby, um, and it's how I started. Uh, but uh, there, are, there are many, many other interesting philatelic items that you can collect uh, beyond stamps, and I'll show you some examples of those uh, to give you a taste of what's possible. Uh, then I will talk a bit about the difference between topical and thematic. A lot of people maybe use those a bit interchangeably, but there, there are some differences and, and I'll explain that. And then, as I said, just a little bit at the end about thematic exhibiting, which is really all about storytelling and telling a story using your stamps and other philatelic material. Uh, we're all familiar with sort of, and I put in quotations, traditional ways to collect stamps. So the traditional ways to collect focus on the philatelic aspects of the material that you collect. So if you're collecting stamps, if you're a traditional collector, you focus on the stamp production, all the um, pre-production, the design of the stamps, the, the dyes, um, the printings, any varieties, et cetera. Or you may collect, um, you may be a postal historian and you are studying or interested in how stamps are used and the rates and the routes that the the letters take different postal markings. There's a lot of different philatelic aspects that, that different people um, focus on. Um, and they tend to uh, organize their collections according to these philatelic aspects. So they organize a traditional stamp collection by country of issue or a postal history collection would be organized by the routes, the different routes and markings, et cetera. Um, and, you know, a, a 
collection may include stamps, but it can also include postmarks, postal stationery, different aspects of postal history, and, and so on. So in contrast, a topical or a thematic collection uh, focuses on the images or the subject of the stamps rather than on the stamps, the philatelic aspects of the stamps. So what is depicted? What are the um, what, what are the stamps commemorating? What's shown on the stamps themselves? And these collections are typically not organized according to philatelic aspects, but according to the topic or theme that is being collected. But despite these differences, um, they are topical or thematic collections can be just like more traditional collections in that they can include not only stamps, but also postmarks, postal stationery, postal history, really anything that you would could consider in a more traditional collection could potentially also be included in a topical or thematic collection. So really the scope of a topical or thematic collection is really only limited by the collector's imagination. And every collection can be a very unique collection because it's not the same as a traditional you know, country collection where you're filling album spaces and the, the collection is fairly delimited by the issues of that country really a topical or thematic collection can be anything you want it to be. So the subject uh, can be as broad or as narrow as you like. And just to give you some examples, uh, flowers is a very popular uh, topical to collect. A lot of people like to collect flowers on stamps. You may want to collect any kind of flowers, or some people like to focus on certain types of flowers, like orchids, for example. Um, or birds is another very popular uh, thematic. So you may want to collect any kind of bird on a stamp or maybe focus on loons on stamps. This is a nice $1 loon from Canada. Or some people like to collect owls on stamps or falcons on stamps. And you can see where I'm going. There's really unlimited possibilities for what you can collect. Um, some people even, I have a friend who focuses on certain types of uh, falcons. So in his case, peregrine falcons. Or uh, I know collectors who collect uh, stamps that show birds of prey. So this kind of collection may include both owls and falcons. Uh, so when people set out to either start a topical collection or, um, and, and I'll say that I know a lot of people who are sort of more traditional collectors who, you know, have a little side topical collection that may be related to something they do in their job. Um, you know, if you're a, an engineer, you might want to collect trains, for example. Uh, you might have hobbies other than stamp collecting. So if you garden or you do birding or you have a sailboat, you may want to collect stamps, uh, you know, uh, uh, related to those uh, other hobbies that you have. You may want to collect something related to a place that you've lived or that you visited. Um, you might have a favorite food or a sport that you play or a favorite artist or an author. You can see that you know, really, a lot of people tend to pick something that they have some other personal co uh, connection to um, when they're when they're building a, a, a topical collection. And like I said, a lot of people that are sort of more traditional collectors often will have these little side topical collections, and they're just they're just fun uh, to do. And really, you know, it can be anything that tickles your fancy. So for myself, um, Eric mentioned I'm a I'm a hematologist, so that's my day job. I I, uh, I see people who have blood disorders and I do leukemia research. So when I decided um, about 10 years ago, I, I joined uh, an online chat forum and I joined a local stamp club and I decided I was going to try uh, to have a topical collection. So I thought about what I would collect. Um, there weren't a lot of stamps about leukemia specifically, but I did discover that there were a lot of stamps that were related to blood donation uh, because it's a it's a relevant topic to every country around the world. So after I did a little digging, I found that there were probably around 200 uh, stamp issues on related to blood donation and blood transfusion. So that seemed a broad enough topic that I could have a pretty diverse collection, but it didn't seem too broad that you know would be impossible to collect everything. So I started my collection. Uh, the first thing. I did, which is probably what a lot of people do when they start a topical collection, is I started to look for the stamps. So here is the very first stamp that was ever issued, uh, mentioning blood donation. This is from Hungary, issued in 1942. It's from a set of four stamps issued for the Red Cross. Uh, Veradas means uh, blood donation. And, you know, as I started to look for these, there I found a lot of different stamps from different countries. You can see an example of them here. And they promoted uh, blood donation or blood transfusion in different ways with different kinds of images. 
But as I was collecting these stamps, so these are examples of specific stamps, but I found that as I was looking for these stamps, that not all of the stamps in a set uh, may be relevant to your topic. So for example, here's a set of stamps, um, a set of four stamps from Ethiopia that celebrates the 75th anniversary of the Ethiopian Red Cross Society. But out of the four stamps, only one of the stamps is related to blood donations. So you can see some blood donor bags here and a patient getting a blood transfusion. Similarly, the set of stamps from Great Britain celebrating the 50th anniversary of the British National Health Service shows different aspects of what the NHS does. And one of the stamps mentions blood donation, but it's only one stamp out of four in the set. So when you're buying mint stamps, often you have to buy the complete set. So, you know, it's just something to keep in mind that, you know, if you are looking for specific stamps in case about blood donation, you often can't buy just the one stamp. You have to buy the whole set. And then what do you do with the other stamps in the set? You know, I, I have them in my album, but uh, these are just some of the things that you have to think about. And I'm not saying that there's any right or wrong way to deal with this. This is just some food for, for thought for people who might want to have a topical collection. Just to give an example outside my own topic, so if you're a wildlife collector, for example, here's a nice set from Jersey, a set of six stamps that shows wildlife. So this would be a lovely set to include if you're a wildlife collector. But if you're a bird collector, only three of the stamps would be relevant. And, and if you're an owl collector, you know, two of the stamps in the set uh, would belong in your collection. So again, you know, what do you do with the other stamps? Do you keep them all together? Uh, even if you're a bird collector, here's another set from Jersey of uh, six bird stamps, but, you know, maybe you only collect falcons or swans. And then the other question to think about is, do you keep the set together in your album or do you sort the set by bird species? So my friend, I have a friend who collects birds and he breaks up sets in his album and he, he keeps all the stamps showing swans together. He keeps all the stamps showing peacocks in another place, even if they're breaking up the set. So like I said, you can do it however you want, but these are just some of the things that you might have to think about when you're building your collection. Here's some resources that might help you when you're starting to look for stamps. Colnect is an online stamp catalog. There's a lot of functionality in Colnect, but one of the things that you can do is look for stamps on your, on your specific topic. So if you type in the search bar up here, falcons, for example, it will pull up all the stamps that have falcon in the stamp description. And it also, Colnect also has a button here called themes. And if you click on that, it brings up a list of basically all the themes and, and many of the stamps, most of the stamps in the catalog, I would say, are tagged different themes. And so, you know, there's over a thousand different themes. This is just starting alphabetically. So you can see some of the themes that are listed here. And some of them have very few stamps and some of them have a lot of stamps. So here, animals, of course, has 200,000. This is not complete by any means, but, you know, it's a starting point for you to, to help you get started. American Topical Association is, is the largest topical organization for collectors in North America. Um, they have Topical Time, which is a magazine they produce every two months. Lots of stories that are focused on topical collecting, uh, not just stamps, but postmarks and, you know, uh, stories about different topical collectors and examples from exhibits. And they also have this handbook called Topical Adventures that, again, gives a lot of information about how you might go about a topical collection, how to organize it. And it has some tips also about uh, exhibiting if you want to go into that. And I will talk about that a little bit later in my presentation as well. If you're a member of ATA, you can also buy check a checklist. So they have almost 1,500 different checklists, and some are larger, some are smaller, and the cost of the checklist uh, depends on the size of the checklist, but they provide Scott number and a description of stamps in a particular topic, and uh, I think once you buy one, you can also get uh, free updates as well. So those are just some ways that you could get started in looking for, you know, stamps or, or to check out if you're thinking of collecting a certain topic to check out how big that topic might be and how daunting it might be to, to try and collect all the stamps. I did also want to mention as well for people who might not be familiar, just a word of caution. So there are a couple of stamp agencies that are fairly big. So one is, uh, it used to be called Stamparija. They've changed their name now to Stampera. They're based in Lithuania. And uh, IGPC is an organization uh, based in New York. So these are philatelic agencies that have contracts 
with the postal administrations of many different countries, some in many in Africa, some in the uh, Caribbean, and they issue stamps on behalf of those countries for which they have contracts. But many of these stamps, in fact, I would say the majority of these stamps are probably sold directly to the new issue market, and they target topical collectors. Many of the topics are not even relevant to the issuing country. So they, you know, they know what topics are popular with collectors like dinosaurs, uh, Elvis, Marilyn Monroe. So a lot of these kind of things you'll see have nothing to do with the issuing country, but they know that topical collectors will, you know, be interested in buying these. The stamps are generally not available for postal use in the country for which they were issued. So they're, you know, being sold directly to the topical collecting market and people who live in those countries often don't even see them in the post offices. And even if they did, the face values are often very high and way more than what you would actually need to mail a letter locally. They are legal issues because, you know, these agencies do have contracts with the countries that they're issuing them for. But uh, a lot of collectors would consider these to be so-called wallpaper. So not really a le legitimate in the sense of, you know, being something relevant to the country that's being issued. Now, you know, if you want to collect them, that's fine. But just, you know, I think you should be aware of, uh, you know, that these are a bit different than country or stamps that are being issued by countries where, you know, it's really part of a, of a more restrained stamp issuing program. So, it, so in my collection, when I was looking for stamps about uh, blood donation and blood transfusion, and I was searching online, you know, on eBay and Del Camp, which is another online auction site uh, based in Europe, that has a lot of stamps, you know, available for topical collectors. When I was putting in my search terms, I would start to get hits not only of stamps, but other kinds of philatelic material. And I started to pay attention to them and I uh, started collecting them because they were kind of interesting. So here, for example, are a couple of meters. So this one is from uh, Northern Ireland. And the slogan here, so you, you'll find often meters that have slogans or pictures uh, this one has both, actually. So this is from the Northern Ireland Blood Transfusion Service. And uh, it says, you can't get blood from a stone, neither can we. So, you know, they're using humor to try and encourage people to be blood donors. Here's one from Belgium from 1985 that has uh, a couple of people with uh, the different ABO blood types. You can also try and find pictorial postmarks. These are often produced and available only for a limited time. So this one from Italy uh, shows a mobile blood donor bus uh, that would go from, you know, small town to small town, bringing uh, blood donor clinics to these smaller towns that didn't have permanent facilities for blood donor clinics. And a lot of machine slogans or, or machine cancels will have uh, slogans as well. So this is one from the act uh, from actually the Allied military government in the free territory of Trieste after World War II uh, that uh, encourages people to donate to the blood bank. So you can find lots of different examples of these because postmarks and meters, you know, when they have slogans, it's a way of disseminating public service messages and encouraging people and, you know, getting the word out. So uh, a lot of different uh, topics can be found on these kind of things. You can also find postal stationery. So I started to see some postal stationery. So postal stationery are envelopes where the indicium, the, st the stamp is pre-printed and they often will have uh, caches with text or pictures that might be relevant to your topic. So this particular one is from Bulgaria uh, that shows a patient in the background receiving a transfusion and a nurse holding a young child. And the words here say citizens become blood donors. So it's encouraging people to donate blood. This particular one uh, was actually sent through the mail. It's got a military post cancel. So I, I like to find examples that have actually, you know, been used for the purpose that they were produced for, which is, you know, going through the mail. So this is an example from Romania. It's a postal stationary card. Uh, it's, it's one of a set of six, um, and all six had pictures on them related to blood donation. So this particular one shows a blood donor, and the text there translates as giving blood is an act of high patriotism. So uh, all six examples in used condition in my collection. You can also find uh, advertising. So advertising is a very rich source of material for topical collectors. There are many different kinds of advertising. So some printed on postal stationery. Sometimes you can find advertising printed on the tab of a stamp. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. This particular one is from Belgium. So this card is called a Puble Bell. There's many, many different examples of advertising printed on these Belgian cards. 
the income from the ads was used for social services. So you still paid the face value of the card. It was a postcard that you could send, but uh, they would they would have different ads printed on them. And the, the income that they generated, the revenue from the ads went to uh, help people through social services. This is an example from Japan. This is called an Echo card. And again, you can find many, many different kinds of advertising. In the case in Japan, the cost of the ad actually subsidized the cost of the card. So when you bought a postcard that had an ad on it, you actually paid five yen less than the face value of the card. So here it's 50 yen, you would only pay 45 yen um, and you would be able to mail the postcard. You know, advertising is a huge resource for topical collectors to look for material that's that's related. So, you know, these are I've only had time to kind of give you a taste, but really topical collectors can collect the whole world of philately. So not just stamps, but postmarks and slogans and stationery and postal history. So, you know, you can build your collection however you want and every collection ends up being unique. And that's, I think, one of the fun things about topical and, and thematic collecting. So here's another example. I mentioned, uh, you know, advertising on tabs. This, this particular stamp I have in my collection. So this, uh, so in France, they in a certain period they printed a lot of advertising uh, on the tabs of of booklet panes. So they would have the block of stamps, and then all of the tabs around the stamps uh, had different ads. This one is for a product called beer, and they were advertising that it was good for treating anemia. So you know, I have this in my collection. Does it really belong in a collection about blood donation and transfusion? Because it's talking about anemia, right? It's not talking about blood donation per se. So here's where you start now to move from a purely topical collection to a thematic collection. So the next thing I want to talk about is what is the difference between topical and thematic? So in a topical collection, really every item that you collect is going to depict your topic. So uh, you can think of it sort of like an illustrated catalog. So if you have a collection on butterflies and moths, every item in your collection will have a picture of a butterfly or a moth, whether it's a stamp or a postmark or a meter or a postal stationery, every item should have a picture of a butterfly or a moth. So it's like an illustrated catalog, like I said. In contrast, a thematic collection Every item will either depict your topic or it'll depict some related aspect of your topic. So it's more like a storybook. You know, think of it as a children's illustrated storybook. So I just pulled this uh, off the internet. So here's a, a storybook about butterflies. And the little promotional blurb about the book was learn about the magical world of butterflies, their beauty, their importance to plant life, their incredible metamorphosis and migration. So those are different storylines about butterflies. And you might collect material that depicts those aspects of your story, you know, showing their migration routes or the kind of plants that you might uh, uh, have in your garden to attract butterflies. So there's a lot of different things that you could have in your collection that would help you tell the story about butterflies that might not necessarily have a picture of a butterfly on them. So if we're Thinking in that way, then, this stamp with the tab promoting uh, beer as a treatment for anemia does belong in my collection because anemia is one of the reasons why people might need a blood transfusion. So it fits very nicely into my collection and helps me to tell the story about why people need blood transfusions and why it's important to donate blood. I just wanted to give you some other examples from another one of my collections. So I have an interest, you know, because of my background in medicine, I have an interest in medical philately. So during the pandemic, I started collecting COVID-19 material and there was a lot of it coming out. Uh, so I started out, again, just collecting stamps. Here's the very first stamp that was issued related to COVID-19. It was issued by Iran uh, in mid-March 2020, very soon after the pandemic was uh, declared by the WHO. And, you know, if you, if you look, there's a lot of material that depicts the coronavirus, which is the cause of COVID-19, including, so this is a stamp from a local or a private post in Germany. This is a postmark that was produced by Croatia. They actually initially planned to issue this postmark at the end of March, but there was a big earthquake uh, that actually destroyed the central post office. So they, they postponed the postmark by a month. You can see 25th of March postponed to 30th of April and the postal code changed because they had to move post offices. You can find coronaviruses in the margins of uh, stamp panes. Uh, here's a postal stationary envelope from the Vatican that uh, shows a coronavirus being uh, killed with an injection. 
but you know, beyond, so, you know, this is really kind of like a topical collection on coronaviruses, but, uh, you know, a COVID-19 thematic collection is much richer. And to me, it was a natural extension because there were so many stories that you could tell around the pandemic and what was happening with the pandemic. So for example, uh, social distancing, and here I'm just going to show you examples from stamps, but there's a lot of other material that you could collect. So social distancing, this is one of my favorites. This is from French Polynesia, and it shows two ladies sitting on a bench separated by the distance of six coconuts lying on the ground. So this was the one of the best ways that uh, I saw on de depicting or telling people how far you should distance uh, physically. Here's a stamp from Singapore. This was from a set of six stamps uh, promoting hand washing as kids went back to school. Here's an ATM label from Israel depicting uh, drive through testing centers that they had set up. Here's a stamp from Belgium that, uh, you know, focuses on the social isolation that came out of our, you know, forming our little bubbles uh, during the pandemic. Here's a you know, Austria always has a really uh, innovative stamp issuing program. So they uh, issued stamps made of different kinds of material. Uh, this particular one is a face mask that is actually produced by the material that they use to make their actual face masks. Um, so it might also belong in a, in a collection of unusual stamps, for example. Uh, France issued a number of stamps uh, uh, thanking all the different essential workers. So in this uh, in this particular case, uh, grocery store workers and, and supply chain workers. And uh, here's a stamp from Poland promoting vaccination. And, you know, even even in if you just have a stamp collection, you can you can research and find interesting aspects of these as well. So there's an actual design error on the stamp. I don't know if you can spot it, but, uh, you know, when you get your vaccination, you're getting it in the deltoid muscle. And they've depicted the Band-Aid here on the biceps muscle. You know, so obviously the woman's flexing her biceps to show strength. Uh, but they've put the Band-Aid on there, which is not typically where you get your vaccination. So, you know, you can have fun with uh, things like looking for things like that, too. So there's, again, many other aspects beyond stamps that you can collect. So slogans and meters, uh, as I showed you before. So here's a machine slogan from Australia promoting vaccination and a, a meter mark from Germany with a play on words to so this one. So Impfen in German means vaccination. So they've blended the word Impfen with Frankfurt, promoting uh, vaccination in Frankfurt. This was, this was from uh, a local company in Frankfurt. You can look for many different kinds of pictorial postmarks. So uh, these are a couple from Taiwan. This one actually shows the Omicron variant, and this one shows a little rapid test here. So, you know, you can look for things that show many different aspects of the, of the pandemic. Postal stationery was a big part. Many different countries produce postal stationery and distribute it for free to encourage people to write letters to each other to, you know, help people stay connected. Canada was one of those countries. One postcard out of a set of six uh, English ones, and they, they produced the same with the French first and English second, and, and uh, they distributed one to each uh, household. About 13 million of them were distributed uh, during the pandemic to allow people to, to write postcards to each other. And then there's interesting postal history that you collect. You know, really collecting pandemic philately was an opportunity to collect stuff, to collect postal history in real time. So there were a lot of uh, travel disruptions, you know, flights were canceled, so people couldn't travel, but that also disrupted mail delivery. So there were many uh, examples of uh, mail that was returned to sender because there was lack of, of uh, flight services. So here's one from Taiwan that was mailed to Toronto, Canada, and uh, returned to sender with this really interesting uh, hand stamp that basically says mail returned due to suspension of service and mentions COVID-19. China for a while was disinfecting their mail that was coming from abroad. So this, this is a letter that was sent from Hong Kong to China and it, it uh, had a label put on it that um, informed the recipient that the letter had been disinfected. And then this is a letter that a friend of mine in Thailand received that had this hand stamp on it applied by his local post office because they had had a local outbreak and the workers had to quarantine. So there was some delay in the delivery of the mail. So they eventually did deliver the mail, but put this nice informative hand stamp on there for him. So, you know, just to kind of summarize what I've talked about, I think, you know, there's there's a sort of natural life cycle or evolution of a topical or thematic collector. So, you know, the first thing that happens is you 
you twig on something or you decide that you're going to collect a certain topic. So let's say butterflies, for example, you're going to collect butterflies. So you start out by building a collection of stamps on that show your topic. So stamps that show butterflies, and there's many of them. And then as you search for them, you start to notice that there's other types of philatelic elements. Uh, you can collect, you know, I really love Japanese uh, pictorial postmarks. They're, they're really works of art. And I have uh, a lot of those in my collection that are not even necessarily related to medical philately, just because I, I, I think they're quite beautiful. But you know, you, you can start to build other types of philatelic elements into your collection. And then as you build your collection, it will, I think, naturally evolve to the point where you will start to see that there are storylines that you can organize your material around. And this, I think, leads naturally into the next step in the evolution of a, of a thematic collector, which is which is exhibiting and how you tell your story. And, you know, maybe you want to start out just by making nice album pages that kind of tell different stories around your topic, but it's also nice to make those and then share them, which is really what exhibiting is all about. So for me, you know, I think there's, and I only started exhibiting about probably less than 10 years ago. So I never was an exhibitor. I I started it because my local club is quite an active exhibiting club and they really encouraged me to um, to exhibit when they you know found out that I was building this collection around blood donation. So I thought I'd give it a try. And you know, it's been very, very rewarding because when I started to research my topic, right, to start to figure out how to tell my story and how to put things together. I actually learned a lot about my topic, which might be surprising to you because, you know, I am a, I'm a hematologist, but a lot of the stuff that they taught us in medical school was very focused on, you know, medicines and how to treat patients, but it didn't focus on the history and the social aspects of it. And when I started to dig into that, you know, I found that really fascinating and complemented what I knew in my, you know, professional life. So I learned a lot about my topic and I, you know, had a lot of fun building my exhibit and sharing it with others. And, you know, the joy I think of our hobby is, is in really sharing it with other people and, uh, you know, showing other people what you've learned. And when you do that and people find out what your collecting interests are, they, you know, may have similar collecting interests that can, they can connect with you. But I found that a lot of people, you know, will start looking for things for you. And I've gotten a lot of material um, just because someone was looking through a box and they spotted something that they thought I might like. So, you know, it's really, I think this sort of positive reinforcement and uh, it's a lot of fun. So I would really encourage people to, you know, think about giving it a try if you haven't to tried it before. And everything that I said about topical and thematic collecting also applies to exhibiting. So Traditional exhibits focus on the philatelic aspects of the material that you collect, and it's organized, obviously, philatelically. In contrast, a topical or thematic exhibit focuses on the subject matter, and you are telling a non-philatelic story, but illustrating it with philatelic material. So that can be a lot of fun. If you want to, you know, if you've never done it before and you want to start small, I would encourage you to check out one-page exhibits. So the American Topical Association has, they started this during the pandemic. I think they've done it for two or three years now. One page exhibits. So just on one page, you tell a story, you can incorporate, you know, many different kinds of philatelic elements. I, I've just shown two examples here that I found on the website. And I picked these because they do have a variety of philatelic elements. So this one on the left, uh, just talking about uh, thatched roofs, you know, so they don't have to be profound. They can just, you know, you can pick a little tiny subject that fits on a page and he's got a stamp booklet, some stamps, a meter mark and a postal stationery card. This one is mentioning playing music in a bandstand. So there's a machine slogan, some stamps, a meter slogan, a roller cancel and a postal stationery card. So, you know, there's a lot of variety and you can tell your little story uh, the ATA one page exhibits are not judged. So really it's just for fun. You can just put it out there. Uh, the British thematic association also has a one page exhibit. They, theirs is competition. So, you know, if you're, if you're a little bit more competitive, you can, you can enter one uh, there as well. And then if you want to, you know, if you dip your toe in the water and you decide you like it and you want to try your hand at either a one frame or a multi frame thematic exhibit, think, you know, don't be intimidated by what you might perceive as a lot of rules about thematic exhibiting. Really, the rules or the gestalt of thematic exhibit exhibiting revolves around five things. And I've tried, tried to summarize them here. So first of all, 
you want to decide on a title and a plan. So that really defines the scope of what your story is going to be. So, you know, how broad or how narrow your scope will be. And the plan is really the outline of your story. So, you know, it's like the the chapter format and, and tells people who are looking at the title page and the plan what your story is going to be about. And then development. So what is development? Development is really how does your story unfold? So how do you tell your story? What are the different storylines? Um, the story should progress logically from the beginning, the middle, and the end. There should be a defined beginning, middle, and end. It shouldn't just be kind of random chapters. And then treatment is really about how you illustrate the story. So I, I mentioned that the it's a non-philatelic story illustrated by philatelic materials. So all of your thematic text should be illustrated by some philatelic element. So Anything you say, you should have something to illustrate it, and anything you have on the page should have some thematic text associated with it. So that's really, you know, it should be kind of like, say what you show, show what you say, and all of the philatelic items that you include in the story should be advancing the story without too much repetition. And then try and include a wide variety of philatelic elements. So don't have only stamps, try and include postmarks and meter marks, and um, postal stationery, postal histories, are really as broad, you know, a range of types of material as possible from all over the world is the, is the sort of goal to aim for. And also trying to have a wide range of material in terms of how old the material is. So not only modern material, but also older material, including pre-philatelic material. And that can be challenging for more modern topics. So my topic is fairly modern. The first stamp was issued in 1942. So I've had to use a bit of creativity to kind of, you know, incorporate older elements into, into my exhibit. But, you know, you can, thematic exhibitors can draw on all branches of philately to illustrate their story, right? Postal history, traditional philately, and postal stationery. And you can really include anything as long as you can connect the postal aspect of that item to the thematic story. So you can make a, if you can make a thematic connection, that may be obvious, but it may be, you know, maybe something that is a more creative connection. And that's totally fine too, as long as you can explain it. So it really is a way for people to kind of, you know, show their creativity and innovation. You can, you can try a different approach to illustrate maybe a, you know, familiar aspect of your story or try and come up with a new storyline that, on your subject that maybe nobody else has talked about before. So lots of ways to be creative in this uh, aspect of philately. So I just, in the last few minutes, I just wanted to give three examples from my exhibit. For anybody that's gonna be at GAS next week, I'll be there with my exhibit. I would love to say hello. So, you know, please feel free to come up and, uh, and I would love to chat. So my exhibit is a five frame exhibit that focuses on blood and the development of blood as a, as a modern medicine through you know, blood donation, blood transfusion and transfusion medicine. So I have uh, the top of my title page really gives kind of a preview of what the scope of the story is going to be. And the uh, plan, as you can see, the plan itself reads like a little story, but it basically tells you what my different chapters are gonna be about from a sort of history of blood, through, you know, development of transfusion medicine, and then how blood donors are recruited and how they give blood, and then how all the different ways that blood transfusions are used to treat patients. So you can see there's a beginning, the middle part, and uh, an epilogue at the end. So I'll just show you three examples from my exhibit. So, you know, this is an example of how you can try and find more interesting items to illustrate straight specific thematic details. So in one of my pages, I talk about vampires that feed on blood. And so of course, there's lots of stamps you can find to show vampires feeding on blood. This, this uh, is a pair of stamps from Ireland. But a more interesting way is in Canada, there was a constant plate variety that was produced when something fell on one of the printing plates of the three cent small queen. And it produced these two divots in the neck of the queen that basically look like vampire bites. And this variety appeared in 1892 and then gradually faded over the next four years as the plate was printed and it gradually wore, wore down. So it's an opportunity for me to include a kind of philatelic study. So in a thematic exhibit, you can still do philately. You can have philatelic studies that are sort of brief, in-depth analysis of a specific aspect of traditional or whatever um, aspect of philately. 
as long as you can incorporate it into the storyline. So what I have done in my exhibit is I have examples of this constant plate variety over the four years that it appeared and show how it gradually faded from the uh, wearing of the plate. And I also incorporate this into my story by saying that when vampires don't get blood, they also fade away. So, you know, it ties it together with the with the variety. In one part of my exhibit, I talk about how uh, donated blood is tested and treated in order to reduce the risk of infection being transmitted through a blood donation. So, you know, donated blood is treated to destroy infectious viruses. You're not really going to be able to find a stamp that depicts this. However, what I've done is to illustrate this thematic detail by using a philatelic analogy where I show a letter that has been treated in order to destroy inf infectious pathogens. So this is an example of a disinfected letter that was uh, sent, was stopped at a disinfection station along the way. You can see these little perforation marks in it. That's from a sort of perforator making holes in the letter so that the, the fumes from the fumigator could get into the middle of the letter. So it's it's just a philatelic analogy that I that I use to illustrate the point that donated blood is is treated to destroy viruses, and this cover was treated to destroy infectious agents. And then the last example I'll show you, this is something I've just acquired recently. I haven't incorporated into my exhibit yet, but uh, bloodletting was a common medical practice from you know very early on from antiquity even into the late 19th century. And they basically did bloodletting for everything because they didn't really know how to treat a lot of uh, diseases. And in 1799, George Washington actually died from bloodletting. He developed a throat infection and his physicians bled him very aggressively. And over one or two days, they bled almost four liters of blood. So almost, you know, more than three quarters of his blood volume. And he died probably of shock from that rather than from the throat infection. So again, not something you're going to find depicted on a stamp. But what I've recently bought is this postal stationery envelope. So you can't see it here, but uh, this is an albino uh, envelope. So if you've just tilted a bit, you can see this is embossed uh, indicium. It doesn't have any ink on it because what happened is when the envelope goes into the machine for embossing and inking, two envelopes were drawn in. So both of them got embossed, but only the top one got the ink. So this is what the indicium should look like. But this one underneath a second one didn't get the ink. It only got the embossed embossing. So you can see the indicium there. Someone's inspected it and said it was okay and it passed through the mail. It's actually not that uncommon to find these albino stationaries, but it's hard to find one that's actually been used so, you know, it's it's an impression of George Washington. I'm going to use this because the albino imprint is drained of color. So it's, you know, it's a philatelic analogy that I can use to say that Washington was drained of blood and that's what he died of uh, from bloodletting. I don't have time to show you more examples from my exhibit, but if you're interested, I've actually been writing about it online through, on a stamp forum called Stamp Boards. Back in 2014 is when I started. So you can read about my exhibit from the very beginning. I've been updating it as I go along, you know, talking about the things I've added and my thinking and how I've expanded it. So you're welcome to go. You don't have to be a member of Stamp Boards to, to read the, the thread. And uh, like I mentioned, I'll be at GAS next week. If anybody wants to come up and say hi, I'd love to meet you and chat. So thanks very much for, for listening. That is amazing. Now I understand uh, the frustration that all the hosts and Scott has had that we could have done this for two hours and probably still not get to all the questions. So I want to get to some of the questions. We won't be able to get to all of them. So I'm going to try to start you off with a few easy ones. I also have a, my own list of questions and there's it's not, it's not going to be possible. Thank you for the plug for gas. I hope anyone who's uh, watching this takes Jean up on her offer and her invitation to come see her. Uh, any any exhibit that has uh, Bella Lugosi and uh, fake uh, <laughs> block uh, technologically produced vampire bites on a stamp has to be worth seeing. Now I understand why it's such a great exhibitor. Um, all right, let's start with a couple quick Quick, quick questions. First one that came in is, are there sufficient past issues on toys, on stamps as a collection? Uh, toys. So I I think there are, so I, one of the people on stamp boards actually collects um, traditional games. So things like checkers and chess and, you know, other kinds of traditional children's games. So I think 
you know, maybe not toys specifically, but certainly like children's games and stuff. But, you know, I would encourage you, it's certainly not something I collect, but I would encourage you to, you know, if you, if you, ATA may have a, a checklist or related checklist uh, on that. And if you go to Colnect um, and just search for toys or look under the themes to see if there's some related uh, themes there, I'm sure you could uh, find them. Um, the other thing I do sometimes when I'm looking for stamps is I go to Del Camp. I like Del Camp better than eBay for topical uh, collecting. And just in the in the search bar in the stamp category, you know, just type in toys and don't forget that Del Camp is an international marketplace. So, you know, you might want to put in like the French term or the German term and just see what comes up. And you might be surprised. I think there probably will be quite a lot of stamps available. Thanks for that answer. Um, we're just going to keep plugging through here. We may go a tiny, tiny, tiny bit over eight, but we'll we'll try to keep on the on the hour. Um, next question is, would a collection of unusual stamps, embroidered, wood, seeds embedded, et cetera, be considered thematic or topical, given that the unusual stamps feature different topics? Yeah, so I I don't think it's topical or theme. I mean, I don't think it's thematic because in a thematic collection, you need to tell a story, right? So it would really be focusing on the things that are depicted on the unusual stamps. I think if you're really only focusing on the production of the stamps, that actually probably is more in line with a like a more traditional collection where you're mo more focusing on the stamps themselves and how they're being produced and the material being used. You know, so you're really focusing on the philatelic aspects rather than on the subject matter, right, of the of the unusual stamps. But certainly, you know, I have friends also who collect unusual stamps and there's many interesting things in their collections. Another, this this seems like a short question, but I bet it's, I bet it's not. <laughs> Does the judging of a thematic exhibit give credit for items of rarity? I know, I know your four pillars of exhibiting went through a little bit of that, but is that a criteria? Yes. So if you look at the, you know, uh, the judging the, so I would encourage you to look at the APS manual for exhibiting and judging, and it does have sections on thematics. And if you look at the form, uh, it does have, you know, it it's similar to sort of more traditional exhibits in the, that there are sections, there are points for rarity, there are points for condition. So you do have to Pay attention, you know, try and get the condition or material in the best condition that you can. And if you can include rare material, you do get points for that as well. So, you know, I've tried to in my exhibit, I have, for example, I have some examples of artwork, which is unique. And then I have some really, uh, you know, I've tried to find uh, examples of postal history that are quite rare or unusual. So you do you do definitely get points for that for including that kind of material. Since you mentioned artwork, thank you for that answer, by the way. Since you mentioned artwork, one of the questions here is about someone who asks about starting a topical collection by finding, by looking for paintings that, uh, collections of paintings on stamps. And so their broad question was, uh, is a stamp show like gas coming up a, a place where we would find some of those things, artwork related to stamps? In addition to all the other things, I mean, you you brought up a lot of different philatelic material, some that I'd never heard of. Yeah, uh, paintings. So um, when you're shopping at gas, so anytime you go to a stamp wars, you know, there's many many dealers, and some dealers will be you know specialized in postal history or um, more traditional philately, um, and then some dealers will be specialized in topical, you know, aimed towards topical and thematic collectors. So I, if you're thinking about, you know, that kind of, a, um, you know, shopping and looking for paintings on stamps, try and find dealers that uh, have their material organized topically. So they might have binders on all the different topics. And then you can, you know, I'm sure they'll probably have a lot of binders on art on stamps, for example. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, an easier way to to start your collection than going to like, you know, somebody, a dealer who maybe has their stock organized by country, for example, like you would really have to have a, a list ahead of time to know what you're looking for so that you can go to the individual countries and look for, you know, specific stamps. But if you just want to browse through a topical collection or topical stock, then look for dealers that that are, you know, aiming more towards the topical market. And there are, you know, there are dealers like that. 
seems like we could do just another whole one of these on exhibiting since that's such a part of the process for you. But I want to go back to something that came in a little earlier. So much of what you do uh, is related to what I what you could argue is social advocacy and a lot of stamps that you look at are statements about something that should happen or something that's important. I'm really fascinated by the stamp that was that came out in March of 2020 that seemed really ahead of the curve, right? The, uh, I can't remember the country, but the, the stamp- COVID, yeah, the Iran- It Iranian came out stamp. when, that's right. It came out basically when the rest of the world knew COVID had just really kicked in. What was the process for that to actually have been released or even produced ahead of, you know, the international awareness of that? How yeah. far ahead were they on that? So, you know, it always takes time to go from an idea to producing a stamp. And in Canada, the normal, you know, I'm on the Stamp Advisory Committee for, for Canada Post, and the normal time frame uh, to produce a stamp is about two years. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I can't speak to what happens in other countries. Obviously, there are times when they rush out the production of a stamp, like, you know, they they have a faster timeline, for example, when our former prime minister, John Turner, passed away, you know, it didn't take two years to issue a stamp uh, commemorating him. So, you know, sometimes things can be rushed out. You know, I don't know what happens in Iran, but obviously there is still a lag time because you have to do the design and then it has to go to the printers. So you're, you're never going to be completely up to date. And actually that Iranian stamp when it came out, um, COVID-19 had been named, but there was no uh, mention of COVID-19 on the stamp. There was only a picture of a coronavirus. And actually the first stamp that mentioned COVID-19 was issued later, uh, I think towards the end of the next month. I can't remember the ex exact date, but it was from Vietnam. So that was actually the first stamp that mentioned COVID-19. So there's always, you know, and it was like two or three months after the WHO named the, the virus. So you know, there's always going to be a, a bit of a lag, but it might be shorter, it might be longer, it just depends on the the uh, initiative and the commitment of the postal authority. Yeah, thank you. That's it's uh, the, the process of getting that into the public uh, is, kind of, I'm sure, is pretty fascinating all by itself. Yeah. Um, I want to, let's see, so let's uh, get a couple more. We're at 755, so I think we can fit two or three more in here. Um this one is, thank you for your excellent presentation, Jean. I reviewed your exhibit of Blood Online. Someone did their homework in advance of today's seminar. Do you have any hints on how to lay out, design, <clears throat> excuse me, your materials, especially when you're using windowing or cuts in the page to feature only a portion of a cover, for example, an interesting so, postmark? So that's a very design-oriented question, technique. Yeah, so, so let me, I'll try and answer that in sort of a high level way. So the program that I use when I'm designing my exhibit pages is uh, Microsoft Publisher. I know a lot of people use Word, but I actually find it very difficult to use Word because it's very difficult to um, arrange the text and pictures and keep them nicely arranged. And when you move things around, it tends to move, you know, it tends to inadvertently affect other layout. So I use Publisher, which is a a layout program. It's like, you know, I use that when I'm making the our club newsletters as well. So you can insert text and pictures and move things around and size things, you know. So what I do is I I measure all my objects and I you can specify the exact size on the page and then I can move things around. Um, and uh, you mentioned windowing. So when you're when you're showing a postmark, if you have a postmark on a large envelope, and really, the postmark is the part that's relevant to your story. What you want to do is cut a little window in the page um, so that you can just show the postmark and hide the rest of the envelope behind so that it doesn't waste space on the page. And you can use the rest of that space to show something else. Um, so I, I do have a description of it in that stamp boards um, blog. So you, you can have a look at that. But, you know, if you're if you're uh, coming to um, gas, I can also show you examples on on my um, actual exhibit. I love uh, that is, I think, your fourth pitch for gas. So if that is not convincing <laughs> enough to all of you folks out there, I don't really know what is. Uh, this, this is a, a very compelling. Uh, it strikes me that exhibiting is a frightening step for a lot of people who are just beginning to collect. And you talk about being a beginning. You know, we, we talked at the beginning of, before this about 
um, a lot of this topical being kind of the gateway into a lot of collecting for people. And I imagine exhibiting is a, is a big step for them. So is that a, what would you say about that step? I had never exhibited before. I joined a local stamp club. Like I said, they're a very active exhibiting club and they really encouraged me to exhibit. So I started out, you know, I did a two frame exhibit at a local show that my club organizes. So that's a very gentle way uh, to, you know, get your feet wet. Um, and, you know, the judges were really encouraging. They gave me a lot of good feedback. And I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a process, right? So um, I, I did it, I, I got feedback, I went back and revised pages, and it's been a continuous learning process for me. I, you know, I've learned so much, not only about my topic, but also about exhibiting and what's, you know, what's good material, what, what, what are good things to incorporate and, and the kind of things I talked about at the end, you know, making these sort of creative connections, I didn't really start doing that until maybe the last, I would say maybe two or three years, uh, you know, so it, it's a process. And, and, uh, you know, when I started, I would never have been able to, to kind of produce the, the sort of pages that I'm, I'm doing now, but it's been, a, you know, very fun don't be intimidated. You know, I, I know it, it can be, it seems like, you know, intimidating because you see all these fantastic exhibits, but I think everybody has to start and everybody um, it's really hard to understand how to do it unless you actually do it. Like you can, you know, I read all about it before I started, but to really understand what it is and get feedback, you know, I think you really have to get your, you know, get into the muck and, and actually just do it. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, make mistakes, and that's totally fine. And then you, um, you know, you learn how to how to um, improve it or expand it. And, you know, I'm, I'm still learning, like I, you know, I have friends who are way ahead of me, and I'm still trying to, you know, learn and figure out new things. So it's, it's just a fun process. I think learning, learning is just a fun thing to do. And, I really like, you know, the the American Topical Association has their National Topical Stamp Show, which is all topical or thematically organized exhibits. So it's all storytelling. And um, to me, I, I like those kind of exhibits when I go to a stamp show. I, I tend to gravitate towards those. So, you know, the, the, the National Topical Stamp Show, it's all topical. So, you know, it's, it's just a lot of fun and you learn, you see all kinds of crazy things and, and uh, see it's exhibits about all different subjects and things you never thought that there would be stamps on uh, or other stuff. So it's, it's just a lot of fun. I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to apologize again to a number of you who are not going to, we're not going to have time for a lot of these questions, but we'll make sure that they get to Gene um, uh, afterwards. I do want to let you have do one more. This this maybe is a softball, maybe it's actually an impossible question. I am not sure. But the last one we'll do for, for tonight is, Jean, how do you keep an inventory of your stamps? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't actually, I don't think I have an inventory of my um, blood donation stamps. I do use Colnect uh, a little bit when I'm trading, like I have, I do have some country collections just like, you know, on the side, this is how I became a stamp collector. So I do do some swapping and stuff online. And I, and I've been using Colnect to actually keep track of what I have and what I need. Um, so that's, that's actually an easy way to, uh, to inventory stamps. It takes a little bit of work up front to kind of put your stock into the lists, but once it's done, it actually makes things a lot easier. So that's what I use. All right. Thank you for all of that. Thank you for all your great questions. Again, I'm sorry we can't get to all of them, but we'll make sure that they get answered one way or the other. Or you can just come to GAS and ask them, <laughs> Jean, yourself. Thank you, Jean, very much for this fascinating presentation. It's I'm, I, There are a lot of thank yous for your wonderful presentation, your expertise, and your creativity, which is really fun to watch you just uh, talk about. Um, don't forget to, this will be posted to YouTube uh, shortly, probably uh, tonight or tomorrow. If you want to stay up uh, to date with uh, the stamp chats, so there will be others coming up in August and September. We're scheduling those right now. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the APS YouTube page for all of our future stamp chats and to get linked into the, to the older ones. Um, if you do not see, if you're not a member of the APS, the question is, why not? We'd love to have you as part of our stamp community. So for more information, visit us at stamps.org. Um, I thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Jean, again. See you in a week. 
uh, and we'll close us up now. Thank you for thank you for showing up, everyone. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.